with um, a lot of clapping and hooting and cheering, can you welcome our first guest speaker, Philip Reed? Thank you very much. Um, Michael tells me that I am your first ever guest speaker, which is good because um, I've not done a lot of guest speaking, so it's a relief to know that I'm not having to follow anybody. That would be impressive. Um, I don't really know what I'm doing, but uh, hopefully you don't really know what guest speakers do, so I should be able to get away with it. <laughs> uh, I have a PowerPoint <coughs> sorts, which has got a few images on it. Not quite as many as I was hoping. I did knock up one of my own yesterday. This is one of the friends did for me. So my, my improved version um, is so improved that it doesn't actually work. Because, um, I'm not. I'm not very. Uh, I'm not. Very, I'm one of those people. Back in the sort of the 1990s, it was possible to, to get by by to say, oh, computers, I'm not interested in computers, they don't the internet, no, of that. And you'd be able to sort of charm and etc. And you could do that. And then round about the turn of the century, suddenly not knowing how to use computers became like not being able to read. It was that dignified. So I was very quickly trying to trying to make up for lost time. Um, but clearly without great success. But anyway, we had a kind of we had a kind of a presentation here, which is just basically a few images so that you don't have to look at me all the time while I'm while I'm talking. Um, so I'm going to um, ramble on a bit about my life and works, and then at some point I shall hope that you'll have some questions on <coughs> the floor and we can kind of turn it into a whole conversation, which always seems to me to work better than, than just me standing up here throwing words at you. Um, this is published, and it probably never will be. Uh, I, a few years ago, my friend, the illustrator David Wyatt, um, was saying he was to doing a comic book, a comic book, because that was where he came from. He started out from the comics, and then he's ended up as uh, basically an illustrator of children's books. And um, and I said, well, why not do a Mortal Engines comic based on my Mortal Engines series? Not an adaptation of the books, but something set in the same world but different. So we, we started, I wrote it. it Take a long time to write a comic book, really. You know, you can just knock on that quite easily. So I, I knocked out a, a script for him, and he settled down. We did we did a couple of chapters of it, a, a sort of a, a sample to take publishers, thinking, "Hooray, publishers will want this." But sadly, they didn't. It it's 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 very hard to persuade a, a children's book publisher to publish a comic book because they're very expensive. They'd have to pay David's time for a year, basically, for him to, for him to draw a whole a whole book of this. Um, and there's no way they could make that money back, really. They didn't, they didn't see a, a big enough market for it. And there were various other problems, like you know, the, the shelves in the children's section. You know, all, my, all my books are that size, they're all filed together, and then the comics book will be kind of over with the picture book somewhere. So it led to all sorts of gnashing of teeth and publishers, <coughs> and nothing's ever happened with it. But I thought it does illustrate quite well for um, if you haven't read the uh, Mortal Engines, or if you read it so long ago that you've forgotten it. I thought it illustrates quite nicely the, the concept of the world in which it's set um, without being able to read the first page to you, which is what I usually do for, for my usual audience who are kind of smaller than you. Um, so this is, this is the Traction era, which is a kind of a, it's, a, it's an indeterminate <coughs> number of years in the future, a far, far future, I think, thousands of years in the future, and civilization has collapsed a couple of times and kind of staggered back up to a, a, a sort of First World War kind of level of technology with occasional random bits of, of bizarre high-tech thrown in. Um, and the way it works is, um, as, this, as this chap has seen from his airship, from up here in the blue, I've seen it all. Cities hunting big towns, big towns hunting smaller ones. Uh, so there's a little, a little, a little wheelie traction village escaping from a larger town. And then the larger town itself about to be devoured by this this bigger city. It's a food chain. It's a world based on a food chain called municipal Darwinism, in which cities move around on cattle tracks and, and giant wheels and pursue smaller cities, which in turn pursue the little towns, which pursue the villages, which pursue anybody who hasn't got their, their house or, or hamlet moving yet. And that's, that's an idea that came to me um, many years ago, right back, sort of end of the 80s, beginning of the 90s, I think. <coughs> And, uh, and I've been living off it ever since. Um, but I shall come back to that later. I'm going to go back to... Oh, sorry, there's another page of that. That's, um, but that's not particularly relevant. I'm going to go back to the beginning. This is me, uh, young and innocent. I must have been about nine or ten there, with my nose in the book as usual. I can remember the cover of that book very clearly, but I, I can't remember what it was. It isn't anything by any author I've 
I've heard of since, but it was a fantasy. It was it was a fantasy in the kind of Alan Garner, Diana Wynne Jones kind of tradition, which is very much what I used to read when I was um, when I was that age. I remember uh, coming across. I think when I was about seven, my teacher at school read us *The Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe*, and I can remember absolutely clearly sitting there and hearing the opening chapters of that, and being struck by this idea that you didn't have to set a book in the real world. You could make up your own world and set your story there. And that's really what set me writing, I think. I probably did used to write a bit before that. But um, as, as all people do, I guess, or sort of invent stories at least. But, um, but I think it was, it, was, it was the language and the wardrobe that really got me thinking, oh yes, I want to write stories, I want to make up worlds. And then quite quickly after that, I um, discovered Tolkien. My, my dad, I think, had heard uh, an adaptation of The Lord of the Rings on the radio, or a reading of it, some, some years before. This must have been back in the late 60s, very early 70s. And uh, he thought it was good stuff, and so read it to me. And that, that you know, even better than Narnia, because you didn't even have it, didn't even start out in this world. It was just its own world completely. So that really kind of set the tenor of my, my childhood reading and my childhood writing, because all the way through childhood, as far back as I can remember really, certainly from when I was seven or eight, I, 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 I've been writing, I've been, I've been writing stories <coughs> and books. I bought, I went down to the news agents across the road from where we lived and buy a nice red Sylvine notebook, which I suppose has got about 50 pages in it, and I'd bring that home and I'd, I'd start writing my book on page one and it'd have a few illustrations and maps and things and I'd keep going until I got to the last page and then I'd finish the story very quickly and say, that is a book, it is finished. Um, and uh, I mean, all these, all these books, none of them were any good. I don't, I don't have any of them. I, I think if, if I did look back at them, I don't think they would show any great latent promise. Um, they were, they were all, um, they were all knockoffs of whatever I was enjoying at the time. So you know, I'd read Narnia and I'd write my, my Narnia knockoff, and I'd read the Lord of the Rings and write my Lord of the Rings knockoff. And um, I would read Alan Garner, who I don't know if he's much read anymore, but he was a great fantasy writer of, of my. That, month, that, that, that kind of period, great children's fantasy writer, and I, I, I ripped him off a bit, I think. Um, what I didn't really like was, was science fiction at all. Um, I, I was scared. I, um, I'm quite, I was quite a timid child. I didn't like being, being frightened. Um, and I still don't, actually. I, don't, I won't read horror stories or, or watch horror movies or anything like that. I don't, don't really enjoy being scared at all. I know people do. I know it's supposed to be all sort of exciting, but it uh, never worked for me at all. I just thought, oh, this is nasty. I must avoid this. So I didn't like being scared, and I thought science fiction was scary. It always seemed to be frightening to me. It was about kind of alien. I think the thing is, I was quite happy with all the monsters in The Lord of the Rings and the Greek myths and stuff. quite like those. Monsters, I really like those. But um, when it was science fiction, it tended to happen kind of in the present day or in the future. You thought, oh, could actually happen. Aliens arriving or something. No, I don't like that. That's scary. I like it to be safe in the past. Um, and Lord of the Rings and things I uh, feel like the past. So I kind of avoided science fiction. Occasionally, mm -hmm. all my friends at school would watch Doctor Who on Saturday night and come and say how fantastic Doctor Who was. Um, and once or twice I turned it on, but it always looked kind of scary to me. Even the music was scary, so I turned it off again. And I never, never watched it. Um, and then when I was about 12, <coughs> the, um, um, the first Star Wars film came out, which is now the fourth Star Wars film by a bizarre twist of Hollywood um, money making. Uh, but, but the Star Wars, as it was then called, um, uh, came out. And that completely, well, for, for, for a lot of people in my, my generation, it was a complete revelation. I watched it again quite recently, actually. A friend of mine was, was staying, and she admitted that she's my, my kind of age, but she admitted she's never, never seen Star Wars. And Sam, my, my son, and I said, you've got to see Star Wars. How can you have survived without seeing Star Wars? So he's only watched Star Wars. And it's a terrible film. It's, <laughs> <laughs> I, watching it again, I, I've always, ever seen it, I, you know, I've still seen it many times, but I've always been watching it with this sort of nostalgic glow from when I was 12. I'm watching it again with somebody who hasn't seen it, and you come to it new. Gosh, it's so creaky, and the dialogue is terrible, and the acting is bad, um, and it's incredibly predictable. But of course, when you're 12, you don't get that. You don't, you, you don't know where the story's going. This is all predictable, because you haven't seen all of the things that it's, that it's, it's basing itself on. And the, the bad acting and the terrible dialogue doesn't make any sense at all when you're 12. It just goes straight in your head. You're just amazed by the stuff. And the stuff was amazing. 
it's, it must be impossible for you to imagine how astonishing that opening shot of Star Wars, where the, the big triangular spaceship comes rumbling over the top of the camera. There had been nothing like that. None of us had ever seen anything like that. I, I guess um, the effects in 2001, which must be sort of five or six years before, maybe a long before, um, the, that, that had very good effects, better effects in many ways. But that's a kind of a long, slow intellectual movie, and 12 year olds hadn't seen it. Or if they had, they got bored and dozed off. Um, so, so Star Wars, these enormous um, spaceships zooming around, shooting at each other, that was kind of an eye opener. But more importantly for me, I think, was that it, it, it sort of it all looked old. Um, we didn't all look old, but it, it, there was this sort of sense of things being rusty and used and battered. And you know, the, the spaceport is made of mud brick, and the, the hover cars were kind of rusty and cleaned and dented. And, um, and a lot of the costumes, all quite, quite obviously, I might not know exactly where they came from when I was 12, but I could see that they, they have this sort of historical quality to them. They're kind of based on samurai robes and things. And so suddenly it had that mixture of, of, of past and future. And I guess maybe that made it sort of feel safe for me. And I thought, oh, I like sci-fi. Um, or at least I'm very interested in sci-fi. So I, I, I ran off to the library, and um, you know, there, wasn't, there wasn't a lot of wasn't a lot of other options at that point. Seeing, seeing Star Wars and thinking, wow, yes, science fiction, I want to know all I can about this. But there wasn't really a lot more to find out. There, was, there, were, there weren't any other films for a while until kind of a year later when all the Star Wars knockoffs started appearing. Um, and there wasn't very much on telly. There was Doctor Who, but uh, that was a bit ropey and um, kind of living on for six months a year or something. So, um, so I, I, I went charging off to the library and I just started reading all the science fiction I could get my hands on which mostly at that time meant stuff from the 50s and 60s. And it was all, almost all that I remember, it was all published by Victor Goans in these yellow library hardbacks. There was no picture on the cover or anything. They were just, it was just a plain yellow jacket with red writing with the title and the black writing with the author's name. So you didn't really know what you were getting. You just knew it was science fiction, so you wanted it. So <coughs> I used to, to, to get these things and run home and, and, and read them. Um, and. Uh, Really, that, that's what I read through my through my sort of young teens. It was sort of a bridge for me, I suppose, out of out of my childhood reading and into grown-up stuff, um, which I think a lot of people probably experience. It's that it's kind of what you read when you're when you're 12, 13, 14. And and I did read almost exclusively science fiction. And it was also um, as I as I grew older as well. It was a, it was a real boom time following on Star Wars, so a, a huge boom in, in science fiction cinema. And looking back, the, the stuff that came out while I was at that kind of impressionable young teenage period, um, it was things like Alien, Aliens, and Blade Runner, and um, Terry Gilliam's Brazil, all of which uh, um, uh, still, I, mean, I still, when I, when I see a science fiction film, almost all of them are kind of riffing on the, on the things that were developed in, that, in, in those movies. Um, so that was quite important as well. Science fiction fans at the time, I don't know if this is still the case, probably not, but the, uh, I used to go to, I went to Cato a couple of times to science fiction conventions when I was a teenager, and the, um, the sort of the old guard science fiction fans, so they, they were like jazz buffs, they were, they were really sort of come out of it, they disapproved of everything, and they really didn't like movies, they hated the sci-fi movies, oh, it's not real science fiction, they would say, but secretly I always <coughs> kind of like them. I guess I'm quite a visual person, and um, I found that sort of, um, you know, they, they gave me the pictures while the, the, story, the, the books gave me the, the stories. So that was all very, very important to me as well. Um, I think on this PowerPoint, yes, this is, this is another um, part of my sort of sci-fi education. My dad at some point, I don't know where from, maybe somebody at his, his office was selling them off or something, but he got hold of a very box of sci-fi magazines from the 50s and 60s. Mostly Galaxy and some other stuff, sort of astounding tales and things like that. And these were just, they're just, I suppose there were about 10 or 12 stories in each one. And, um, and that was where a lot of my, my science fiction reading happened from, from these things. Loads and loads and loads of authors. And, and you would, in an, in an issue like this, you would find, I mean, looking at it now, Clifford P. Simak I've heard of. I can't remember what he wrote, but I know the name. Um, John Brunner was quite, quite a big name in the 60s. Um, the other two, Christopher Grimm, Willie Lay, 
never heard of them, I'm afraid. Um, so you would get this, this mix of the real big name authors, really <coughs> great science fiction writers, so there's also Ray Bradbury and, and Heinlein and people, um, and people you never heard of, but they were all quite good stories, or, you know, they at least had a good idea behind them. It was a, it was a, good, it was a good sort of, um, I don't know what science fiction does. And then as I grew up, I, I, I sort of started to focus in a bit more and discover the, the authors I liked best, the ones who spoke most to me. Uh, Ray Bradbury was um, an enormous influence on me. He was the first writer I remember reading where I noticed that there was something going on, you know, it wasn't just a story, there was something going on here other than the story. And what was going on was the language, you know, his use of words. Um, he's not actually that interested, you know, that he's not that interested in sort of the science fiction list of his science fiction stories. They're kind of vaguely set in the future. But the science, the technology is an interesting. It's, it's sort of a poetry, it's a strange kind of poetry about about the possibilities of the future and the, the, the possibilities that, that, that science and technology offer. Um, there's one of his stories um, which begins, it, it's, I, I'm, I'm quoting it from memory, but I think it's about right. He says, um, the rocket came down out of space. It came from the stars and the shiny movements, the black velocities and the endless empty gulfs of space. And I can remember reading that and just thinking, ooh, I like this. I like the feeling these words give me. So I, I, I sort of, I found myself kind of aligning much more with the Ray Bradbury approach to science fiction than with the more sort of technical, um, the, the more hard science fiction people, who I admire completely, but um, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not technically minded. I, I, uh, I am what I think scientists call stupid. Um, I don't have that, that, that the grasp of, of science that, that I should, that I would like to have. And I've always been drawn more towards the poetic end of things. Um, so Ray Bradford was my fave for a long time, and I loved his, there, there was a big anthology of his, his complete short stories, that came two volumes that was around in the 70s, beginning of the 80s, and I, I bought that and read it and read it and read it, and I, I, I wrote very consciously in a sort of Bradburyan style, and I, uh, I sort of tried to set myself a task of writing a short story a week kind of thing. And um, again, I'm sure they weren't any good. They were that, if I read them now, the, the, the Bradbury um, echoes would be, would be painfully obvious, but it was good, it was good practice. It was, good, uh, it was good experience. If you're interested in writing, I think writing a story a week is probably a good thing to do. Um, it kind of keeps you keeps you thinking, keeps you on your feet, it um, exercises the muscles of your imagination. Um, and as I went through my teens, um, I started to discover in the anthologies that I was reading these, these strange stories by J.G. Ballard, um, which they had that Bradbury thing as well, that strange um, hypnotic quality of language, but they are <coughs> they, they are much, much odder stories. They are, they are, do, do we know? Do people know Ballard generally? Uh, are you familiar with them at all? He's, uh, he started out in the, in the 60s with sort of the new wave of science fiction authors who came through in the 60s and, and decided that all the kind of the 1950s kind of um, gung ho space opera types were, were all rubbish and they should be writing about inner space and taking lots of drugs and living in Notting Hill and. Um, Experimenting, it's sort of rock and roll sci-fi, really, that comes in there. Very, very psychedelic and, and strange and odd. And J.G. Ballard sort of fits kind of into that for a while. And he wrote some some great science fiction stories and a series of, of, of very odd disaster novels. Basically, he destroys the world in, in various ways. And you know, the drowned world, very obviously, is about a flood. And then there's one called the drought where water has, has, has vanished and everybody's wandering around in the desert and, and then it gets stranger and there's, there's one called the crystal world in which a kind of runaway crystallization is starting to turn everything into glass and his characters wander through these strange landscapes. There's very little actual story as such and nobody really does anything, they're completely passive. His, his heroes can't really be bothered to do anything much about these disasters that are, that are afflicting them. They just kind of go with the flow. Um, and these, these I, I think, for me, these, these are where sort of science fiction turns into literature. I think he's one of the great writers of the, of the 20th century. Um, and he, he, later on, he departs from science fiction and pretty much renounced it and, and, and was fairly rude about it in his, his later years. But um, all of his books, 
even when they're not science fiction, they feel like science fiction. They, they, they make you look at the world as if it's an alien planet. So he became a great, a great influence on me as I got older and sort of more sophisticated. And then, when I was at university, this, I'm sorry, this will be like prehistory to you, but to me it seems quite recent. Um, William Gibson, you, you are, you, you've come across, I guess, maybe not. Um, William Gibson, this was, this is the last of my, my tour, my trip down memory lane books. So, and the reason I put it up here, in fact, is because um, I didn't finish it. This is, this is where I stopped reading science fiction. It came out in 1984, and it was really, it was sort of very new, the new big thing. It was, um, among, among the science fiction fans, it was the book that everybody was reading, which is why I read it, I guess. And it introduced um, the, the cyberpunk movement. It, it was sort of set in a, a world where people um, were, were able to sort of plug their brains straight into computers and interact in, in cyberspace with each other and stuff. And I started reading this, and it's, 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 a, it's a very well written book. William Gibson's a fantastic writer, and I would highly recommend all of his stuff, um, which, I, which I've gone back and read since. But at the time, back in 1985, didn't really mean much to me. It was, it was full of computers, which I knew nothing about and didn't, didn't understand and didn't particularly want to understand. Um, and it just, I don't know, I think I had <coughs> enough science fiction at that point. I've been, what, sort of 20, and suddenly I go about halfway through this, and I thought, oof, I'm going to read a proper book. And um, from then on, I pretty much avoided SF and fantasy, more or less completely. And, and I went off and I sort of uh, read up in the classics and, um, and things like that, and, and, and literary fiction, and all sorts of stuff that I thought at the time was hugely superior to science fiction. But I still was writing all the time, I still kept writing, and for some reason, whenever I wrote, what I turned out wasn't literary fiction, it was, it was you know, there was always some element of science fiction or, or fantasy in there. That just seemed to be how I started stories. You know, how I, how I start a story is some sort of odd sci-fi or fantasy idea comes to me, and I play with it and, and invent characters who are going to experience this this world, this phenomenon that I thought of, and the story appears. So, um, the stuff I was writing at that time, I, I'd been through college, I was at art college, I, I studied as an illustrator at Cambridge Technical College in the 80s, and um, realised fairly, uh, fairly early on that I probably didn't have what it took to be, to be the great illustrator I wanted to be, so I rather dropped out and I started doing a lot of stuff in the uh, theatre. I, I did a lot of comedy shows and things, reviews, and uh, friends of mine doing stand-up comedy, and I started writing for them, writing jokes for them, and sketches, and then after you've been writing jokes and sketches for a year, <coughs> you start to, to do something a bit bigger, so they, I, I started to write longer shows, um, which usually were presented as comedy shows, but they tended, as the stories got more complicated, they tended always to involve some sort of strange fantasy element. Um, there was always, you know, sort of a monster or a parallel world or something like that. So there was always that element ticking away. And then um, if I, I used to make films as well, as well as making the, the shows. I used to make movies. And these days, of course, everybody makes movies. You do it on your mobile phone and upload it to YouTube, and the whole world can see them. But back then, that wasn't really possible. I was I was working away on a little Super 8 movie camera and cutting the film up by hand and editing it all by hand. And then I sort of hire a, a room above a theatre and show it to an audience, you know, if I was lucky, an audience about as big as this. Um, which was expensive. And so to fund this filmmaking habit, I got back into illustration. I realised that I wasn't the illustrator I would have liked to be, but I could, you know, I could knock out a cartoon for the latest age of woman's realm as well as the next man. So that's what I took to doing. Um, there comes a point as well, when you've been kicking around in the, the artist's quarter of Brighton, where I was then living, when you've been kicking around in the artist's quarter for, um, I say artist's quarter, um, <laughs> it's, it's it piss artist's quarter, it's, um, <laughs> it's, you know, uh, it's Brighton, it's, um, it's, it's, um, but, but there we go, you know, we thought, it, we thought we were artists, we thought it was an artist's quarter, we were happy, but we were poor, and when you've been poor for, um, you know, a few years. When you get to about 25, 26, and you still haven't got two pennies to rub together, and you haven't used one penny in a button, um, you start to kind of think, hmm, money would be nice. 
a job of some sort. That's what other people have. That's how they get the things that they, you know, the clothes and houses and food. Um, those are good things. I want those things. <laughs> and I, I have no skills. I have nothing at all to offer the world, except I have this value to draw quite quickly. So um, I, uh, I, I, I swallowed my pride and took my little portfolio of drawings round to a woman's realm and all the, all the, all the magazines up in London. And to my surprise, I, I went in expecting them to go, you can't draw, get out. But uh, they went, you're as good as anybody else. Do us, a page, do us a cartoon for the letters page by Monday. And I kind of decided that I, you know, even if I wasn't that good, I could at least be prompt. So I always made absolutely sure never, never, never to miss a deadline. And reasonably quickly, I developed a career as an illustrator, um, which was great because the money was coming in. Except it wasn't great because I'd done this basically to fund my filmmaking habit. And I no longer had time for the filmmaking habit because I was too busy illustrating. I, I, I would sort of start rehearsals or something and go, oh, no, sorry, we've got to scrap this because I have to do a cartoon for the last page of Woman's Realm by Monday morning. Um, so I ended up as an illustrator. I, had, I abandoned all my um, flaky um, theatre and uh, movie stuff and, um, and, I, and I illustrated full time. But that left me with all these sort of creative ideas kind of itching to get out. So I started writing again. I went back to writing stories, which I haven't done for a good few years, not since I started at art college. I, I, I bought myself a notebook and just started writing again. And eventually I came, I don't know, um, the question I'm most frequently asked is where did the idea for Mortal Engines come from? And the answer I most frequently give is I don't know I was sitting eating my sandwiches one day in the middle of a big illustration job, and I just had this notion. Well, I think I'd been working, working for a while. I, I, I decided I wanted to write a novel, and I decided it would, I wanted it to be a big, rambly novel set in an imaginary world, the sort of thing I'd enjoyed when I was younger. Going right back to Narnia and Tolkien, really, this idea of making a world your own, telling story. Out. So I had some ideas for characters, um, and I knew it was going to be quite sort of a, a rough and ready kind of world. And I knew it wasn't going to be set in outer space, because there was a lot of that around at the time. I think the sort of dominant mode for science fiction that I was aware of at that time, because I wasn't reading science fiction, but I used to watch it still. And most of the stuff I was aware of was stuff like Star, Star Trek, um, various sort of high-tech kind of shiny computer screens and flashing lights. And, um, and I didn't want to do that, because I thought, well, there's too much of that around. And I certainly didn't want to go back to kind of Elves and Pixies and Lord of the Rings kind of thing, because I like Lord of the Rings, I love Lord of the Rings, but I don't feel the need for a lot more of it somehow, or I didn't at that time, I just I couldn't imagine going there. So I, I was aiming for a sort of a, a scruffy, slightly kind of retro, rusty, Mad Max kind of a world. Sorry, but these were references I'm throwing out, probably Mad Max? Anyone? Yeah, okay, good, that's not exact. Um, I'm starting to realise how incredibly old I am, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, it's when I talk to people like you, I don't go to sleep with the seven-year-olds, um, but, because I'm just a grown up and their children, it's fine. But uh, with, with, with you, I suddenly realised that actually, you know, when I, when I started writing, you, you were the you were <coughs> speed. Um, and that all my references, of all the things I know and love, all the things that made me a writer, um, are ancient history, they've gone. The remakes of stuff that, that was influential to me in my teens are now coming through. Clash of the Titans, things like that. It's all been picked up and remade 20, 30 years on. And that's, that, that makes you feel old. Anyway, where was I? Um, yeah, so I, I sort of got this idea in my mind that I wanted to be a rambly novel and I kind of had vague ideas there was going to be somebody bent on revenge and somebody who was sort of a great hero who turned out not to be a great hero but to be a villain really and this sort of thing. I was having these sort of vague character notions getting into my head but I wasn't sure where to set it. And then I was sitting eating this this one day in the middle of a big um, illustration job and um, I thought, oh, Mobile City. That's a good idea. That's where all these characters can live. It's got a huge mobile city. And I don't know if any of you have seen, there's a painting by Peter Bruegel, the younger, I think, Dutch uh, Renaissance painting of the Tower of Babel um, being built. This massive, ridiculously huge structure, sort of like a, like a huge wedding cake of stone towering up into the sky. And the clouds are kind of wrapping around it, and little tiny little figures are at the bottom with cranes and things, putting the finishing touches to it. Um, and that was the image that flashed into my head. I thought it's going to be like that, but on caterpillar tracks. That's where all my characters are going to live. Um, and then I thought, well, why? Why? 
this is a stupid idea. Who would want a mobile city? What's the point of a mobile city if, if there were mobile cities? You know, if, if there was any point to them, we would have them. Um, and then I thought also, I think there have been mobile city groups. I think, I think other people have done mobile cities. Um, so um, I kind of, I sort of discarded the idea. But it kept niggling away at me in the way that good ideas do. And a, and a little while later, a day or two later, I suddenly realized why you would want a mobile city. And the reason you want a mobile city is so that you can chase and eat smaller cities. <laughs> and at that point, this is where it all came together. I realized, yes, you know, suddenly, and, and in this great cascade of ideas, I realized that, yes, I live aboard this huge mobile city, built up in tiers, like a, like a wedding cake. And right up at, the, up at the top there are the rich, up in their kind of houses and palaces, and their, their mansions, and all the parks, and the air is clean up there. And they've got lovely views, and the views change every day because they're moving around where people live. Um, all sort of slaving away, stoking the boilers, and, and clearing out the poo, and all this sort of stuff. And then in the middle um, is everybody else. Basically, kind of you and me, all, all living in the middle. So I'm desperately wanting to get up to the top. I'm just hoping we don't sort of get sent down to the bottom. It's this. Uh, it's 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 like it's a metaphor for the whole of society. <laughs> but um, like the best metaphors for the whole of society, it's quite funny, I think. So that's what kept me kept me going at it. And of course, at the front of the city, there are these vast jaws. And when it catches a smaller town. Um, it kind of goes, you know, nom nom nom, and, and drags, it, <laughs> drags it into its into its sort of huge dismantling yards, which are hidden inside there somewhere, and, and tears it to pieces and uses all the little bits and scraps of it to kind of build itself bigger and stronger and faster and capable of catching even more little towns. Um, so I realised at that point that I had this food chain world, municipal Darwinism, and I knew almost instantly it was called municipal Darwinism, um, and that just those words set lent a sort of retro feel to it, a sort of a Victorian e Edwardian -E feel which which kind of dictated the whole of the the technology and the, the society. Um, but also I think it, it, it sort of belongs to the past in some ways. This, this thing it comes from it comes from age of great machines. It comes from a time when which sort of oh, before even my um, childhood, this, this time when, when, when machines are huge and vast and you can gawp at them. I suppose the last really big machine would have been the, the, the Saturn V rocket the moon launches. And one of the other things that stuck in my mind, as well as the Tower of Babel picture, was the, the huge tracked crawling platforms that would, would carry the, the Saturn V rocket out to its launch pad, the biggest tracked vehicle I've, I've ever seen, I don't know if it's the biggest in the world. Um, so this, this thing seemed to me to have a very much kind of retro quality to it, because we live in an age where the machines are very invisible, basically. Um, you know, my, 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 my part would just go thing about this size. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. And there's a lot of kind of romance to them. Um, so instantly I, I had this kind of retro thing, this, this past thing going on. Um, and for a long time I, 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 I started this. The first version of this was, um, it was an alternate history book. It was a parallel world book. It was uh, set in, I can't remember when it was set. It was, I suppose it was set in 1900 or something in a world where history had taken a different turn and these mobile cities had evolved. And uh, I, I wrote a couple of drafts of it like that, and then I decided that, that it was sort of fighting against that all the time, because it was so... I had to spend so much effort um, coming up with backstory to explain how and at what point history had taken this, this curious turn. It just didn't work, so I ditched it, and, um, and I decided it's the future. <coughs> uh, it's the far future. And at that point, it started to work a lot better. And then there were other little subsidiary ideas that came from... Um, that came from, from, from this first one. In this, in this initial great sort of slew of ideas, there's the notion of, um, obviously, if you've got these things, these traction cities rumbling around the world, there are going to be people who don't like this. And they are inevitably going to call themselves the Anti-Traction League, and they're going to live up on kind of mountains and islands in places inaccessible to the cities. So that instantly there's some conflict there. Um, and then there were going to be airships, I said, because air, aircraft would, I thought the cities would be too vulnerable to air attack, it would be too easy to get rid of a city if you've got a, 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 you know, a bomber or something that can fly over it. But uh, if you're in an airship that moves so and can be more easily shot down, I thought maybe that would work. And I like airships anyway, or I did at the time. I'm a bit sick of airships now. There are too many airships around. But um, as, a, as a boy, I always quite liked airships. Um, I think because like dinosaurs, they were very, very big and they weren't around anymore. So that, that always makes something quite interesting. You, know, you can see little fragments of the, the graph set there and photographs of it, but you can't actually see airships themselves. And, um, and so I kind of wanted to recreate 
a world where where airships could fly could fly the skies and not explode with quite such monotonous regularity. Um, so that's model engines, basically. The story. It took me it took me years to write. I was I was still illustrating full time, and I didn't imagine really that anyone was going to publish this. My 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 highest ambition for it really. I thought if I if I can finish it. I might do a few illustrations for it and sort of publish it myself, get it photocopied up and bind up a few dozen copies and see if I can flaw them to my friends. Um, that, was, that was as far as my plans went. Um, but at some, and, I, and I kept writing through the, really it was what I did in the 1990s, I think. I can't really remember the, the 1990s and that's why. It's because I was basically illustrating all day and then writing model engines all night and all, and all my days off. And I wrote dozens and dozens and dozens of different drafts of this thing. Um, and the story went off in all sorts of different directions. I don't really plan when I write. I, I, I can't work that way. If I, I, I meet a lot of other authors nowadays, and, and a lot of them um, do this thing of they, the way they work. They, they do the plotting. They, they work out what the plot is going to be, and then they work out who the characters are and design their characters, and then they come up with a big sort of chart or something, you know, which, which sort of tells you what's going to happen in each chapter and who the characters are and how they interact and things. And then they sit down and write the book. Um, but if I did that, I'd just never get around to writing a book because I'd be bored. I, what keeps me writing is that I want to know what's going to happen on the next page. Um, I, want, I want to keep, you know, keep finding stuff out. I, I love writing to the end of a chapter and getting people into a hopeless jam and thinking, how are they going to get out of this? And sometimes, of course, when you sit down the next day, there is no way that you can get them out of that. And then you have to kind of backtrack and find, find another, another room for the story to take. But, um, Doctor Who used to do that when I was a, when I was a lad. Um, after Star Wars, I did start watching Doctor Who, and they would do this thing, um, which is so cheeky when I look back. They would they would do this thing where it was end up at the end of the episode, um, the Doctor or his assistant or somebody would be on top of a huge cliff, and a Dalek or somebody would come up and shoot them, and they'd fall off. And then at the end of the episode, you think, how oh, how is he going to survive? How is he going to get out of that? And you'd have to wait a week. <coughs> To find out, and then the next week, the episode, the, the next episode would start with a little recap, and Doctor would run up to the edge of the cliff, and the Dalek would come up and shoot at him, and he'd duck, and then he, you know, he'd poke the Dalek, and he'd go off, and they'd change it. <laughs> um, that was so wrong. <laughs> but, um, I never liked Doctor Who. That's probably why. Um, <laughs> anyway, I digress again. Um, where was I? Oh. <laughs> yes. Okay. So there I was writing this thing endlessly, and I'm um, not really knowing what to do with it. And at some point, it kind of occurred to me that actually this was the best idea I was ever going to get. This was, this was sort of pitchable. This was something I could take to a publisher and say, it's the novel about huge moving cities that you've been, you've been waiting for. Um, so I, I did. Uh, it must have been kind of 97, 98, something like that. I, I got a version that I was reasonably content with. And I sent it off to a few, a few literary agents. I, I assumed you had to go through a literary agent who would then approach a publisher for you. And I'm still waiting for replies from most of those literary agents. I sent them a stamped address envelope um, and my manuscript, and I heard nothing, and I still haven't. They really weren't interested at all. So um, by that stage, I kind of got quite keen on the idea of publishing it. I, I, <coughs> I've got the bit between my teeth. I'm not, my motto usually is, is if you don't, if at first you don't succeed, give up. I'm not very persistent, I don't persist, I don't persevere. But with this, somehow, I thought, you know, there's good stuff in here. It may not be perfect, but um, there are bits in this that I like. There are places and people that I want other people to be able to read about. So I just kind of kept going. I kept on sending it off to the tree agents and getting no response, mostly. And all the responses saying, you know, sorry, there's no market for this. And I was working at that time for Scholastic, the children's publisher. and. I happened to mention it to one of my editors. I, I was illustrating for them, and I mentioned it to one of my editors. And she said, well, you should search something in our fiction department. And at first, I, I didn't want to, because I hadn't written it as a children's book. I, I assumed it was an adult science fiction novel. The, the draft I was working with at the time was about twice as long as the book that was eventually published. And the characters were kind of in their 20s, I suppose, early 20s. It was, as far as I was concerned, it was a grown-up book. Um, so I thought, no, you know, what, what interest could this have to a children's publisher? And then I thought, well, this is a, an actual editor and she's prepared to look at it and she can at least tell me whether it's worth carrying on with it or whether I'm just bonkers and should give up. So I decided to, to send it to them. And they liked it. 
and um, and I said, well, if I if I turned it into a children's book, would you um, would you be interested in it? And they said, maybe. <laughs> uh, so I because they don't they never really commit themselves publishing people. Um, they don't want to. Uh, well, quite you know reasonably, they don't want to. Uh, they don't want to say anything, which is kind of a contract. So. Um, so I went off and rewrote it again for another six months or something, and I turned my 18, 20-year-old characters into kind of 13, 14, 15-year-old characters, which wasn't that big a change, actually, because this, isn't, this society is not our society. The, 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 a 20-year-old in the world of mortal engines doesn't have the freedom that you would have. Um, they're under the, under the thumb of, of, of adults and authority figures all the time. So it was actually quite a simple, a simple matter to make them into, into teenagers. Um, and I sped the story up a lot. I, I, I did think never much about children's fiction, <coughs> but I looked at children's fiction shelves in the bookshelf and in the bookshops, and I noticed that um, children's books tended to be about that thing, and my book was about that thing. So I thought, right, I've got to really streamline this. So I just went through it, um, as if with a machete, with a metaphorical machete, and I sliced great chunks out of it and took characters out. Um, this has led to a rather high body count in Mortal Engines because there were lots and lots of people who. Whose stories originally sort of evolved in all sorts of directions. And I thought, oh, this is dragging a bit. Boom, we'll kill it. So that makes it an ironically violent book, more so than it was ever intended to be. But in a way, these things improved it, I think. They, they certainly make it much pastier and more page turning and, um, and more violent, which I guess is a good thing. And, um, so I, I took it back to Scholastic and said, well, do you like it now? And they went, no. Really. So um, I suppose at that point I should have given up and cleared off, but I didn't, because I, I thought they were the only, the only people who would even look at it. So I was going to do another version. So I sat down and did another version, which was even pacier and shorter and sparser. They, wouldn't, they didn't tell me what to do. I said, do you like it? They said, mm, no, it's not really quite there. We don't want that. Um, but they wouldn't really give me any pointers. They didn't tell me to go and you know, cut this character or build up that one or anything. I just went off and did it on my own. And just... Um, Worked away at it, thoroughly sick of it by that time. Um, just wanting it finished. That was all I wanted by that point. I just wanted to finish the bloody thing. <coughs> and I thought maybe if they'll publish it, my mum will buy a copy and I'll have a nice bound copy to put on my shelf and I will have been an author and then I can go back to illustrating. Um, so I finished this, this final draft and sent it off to them and they said, oh yes, we like that. That's very good. We love that. And they published it, which was um, superb. That's excellent. It was a very nice feeling when they um, when they finally took it, and I got paid just enough advance to um, to go and have a nice coat made for myself, <laughs> some nice overcoat made, and I thought this is the advance of model engines. This is my writing career translated into tweed. <laughs> it's, a bit too, it's a bit too thick for this weather. It's it's kind of like loft insulation, so I can only wear it in really cold weather. But um, it sort of comes out of the floor. It's like a great coat of tweed. Um, so there we are. I had a book in print. My mum had her copy. I had my own coat. I was happy. And then of course the publisher said, "Well, what are you going to do next? What's your next project?" And I thought, "Oh, crikey! I have just you know, I've just used up all my ideas. Everything I ever wanted to write, I put into my first book." Because that's what you do, especially when you wake up for ten years. I, 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 all the things that I never thought, all the things I ever thought would be funny, I was dredging up ideas from when I was at school and putting them into mortal engines, and um, and it was all gone. And, I, <coughs> it was empty. and then I started thinking again, and I, I came up with other with other notions. Um, and basically, I thought I've invented this world, and it's quite an interesting world. I think I looked through mortal engines again, and. The first thing that struck me was hor lots of horrible bits of writing that I, you know, then now deeply regretted um, and wished I had, had had another go at. But the second thing that struck me was that I felt this world was kind of reasonably convincing. It seemed to have its own um, atmosphere and rationale and, and a lot of nice details and things. There were lots of little mentions about stuff going off, going on off the corners of the, um, off the corners of the story, off, off the edges of the map which I think is kind of the key, in a way, to making a, a made-up world feel real. It's that sense that there's more to it than you're actually reading in the book. That there's this great mass of, of detail, which the author knows, but he hasn't got time to tell you, because the story is too exciting. And, and I, I put quite a lot of that into Mortal Engines, and that meant that I knew quite a lot about this world, outside the edges of the story. So I thought, well, I could go 
I could go elsewhere, I could, I could explore further, I could go to another bit of the world. I didn't want to write the same thing again. Um, so, the next book, have we got a picture of it? Oh, that's a, this is the Mortal Engines fan art. It's never actually been officially connected with the series, but I like it. I think that's, um, that's very much how I saw the in my mind when I was writing it. I like the way it's, it's so high up off its wheels and things. It's, uh, it's rather a fun picture, I think. A chap called Christian Bravery. I found that in the internet. Predator's Gold, that was the second of the, of the books. And it took ages to write, but I was actually, I think I prefer, well, I do, it's my favourite of, of, the, of, the, of the first four. Um, and I just, my starting point really was just to do the opposite. So whereas um, Mortal Engines is about a city going somewhere to, to attack and eat something, this is about a city going to escape. It's, it's, it's fleeing, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a victim city, it's trying to escape. It's a good city, it's a nice city, it's trying to escape. It's all set in sort of deserty, dusty realms, <coughs> wastelands. This one is set up in the, in the, in the, the sort of the polar. The polar ice and snow, so that it looks different. It was a different colour in my head. Um, at the start of so that, that was a help. Um, and then I, I only had, I had two surviving characters from the first, the first book. I hadn't killed them all off. Um, uh, although I think there probably were drafts where I had. But, um, but there were two survivors, Tom and Hester, who were my, my hero and heroine from the first book. And I just decided they could fly off in their airship and have another adventure. And they did. And then as I was, um, as I was, was working on that book, which took a year or two, I started to see where, to, not, not to plan ahead really, but to dimly see where it was going to go from there. I could see how, how the story could continue and develop, and it did in um, Infernal Devices <coughs> and A Darkling Plane. Um, all of these pictures are by David Wyatt, who, who did the, um, the, the comic strip I showed you at the beginning. These were covers of the books at one stage a few years ago, and then the publisher decided they were too old-fashioned and kids wouldn't like them or something, and so we've got kind of blank covers at the moment. We're just writing on, much to my annoyance, because I rather like these. I think these are great. Um, I love the, there's a sort of a wit, a wit that he brings to his machines and his towns and his airships and things, which I, which I really like. Um, so it became a quartet. It sort of spread into a quartet. And although I, I didn't go back and use stuff that I'd abandoned from the, the, the original book, I, I didn't really sort of pick anything out of the waste bin in that sense. But a lot of sort of themes and ideas and, and little details and things that had been in earlier drafts eventually found their way uh, into, the, into, the, into the later books and, I, and found homes there. Um, so yes, the, the world kind of sprawled and sprawled, <coughs> and that is, this is a rough, um, map. It's the scale is all over the place. I'm afraid I'm not good at maps, and I hate drawing them. But this is um, a rough for something I'm working on at the moment, which I'll come back to. Um, which is, uh, you know, the the actually a pointy stick. Ah, here's a pointy stick. Does <laughs> <laughs> need? Um, the first book takes place here. Basically, London goes from here to that, about there, and. Um, and the whole story kind of takes place on that line. And people, people <coughs> wander off from London and they kind of go into marshes. <laughs> and there's the Sea of Gazak, slosh, ah! and off the other side and back up the mountains and it all ends up here. So it's a sort of linear book and it, it's, it's, that's the line. So I didn't really know that much about what was going on in the rest of the world. But then gradually as I was writing the other books, this whole sort of future world started to um, started to, to, to fill in. So it was, it was, it was funny, it was, it was nice filling in the gaps on the, on the map, basically. Um, the project that this rough is for, I'm, I'm putting together a kind of a guide. Um, Scholastic asked me to do uh, kind of an appendix. That word always sounds wrong. But anyway, uh, a, a, a thing. Um, there's another word. No, I can't remember. <laughs> a dictionary, a glossary, a glossary, that's it. Um, they asked me to do a glossary to go at the back of the e-book editions that they're publishing next year. Um, if indeed e-books have backs, the, the glossary kind of goes with them, hovers over them or something. Um, and and uh, it sort of spread, this glossary. It kind of, once I started it, I found, okay, I'm going to explain a certain number of the terms. It basically the idea was that it would explain terms that are mentioned in the book, but not really explain any detail. 
and he was just going to sort of be like a little guide for, for fans and for an extra thing. <laughs> yes, this one is the latest, and it's sort of the story is starting to expand now. There is a journey in this. It's not quite as long as the journeys in the Mortal Engines books, but they go somewhere. There's, there's, there's travel is involved, and there's battles <coughs> and stuff. And then the fourth book, which hopefully I'll be writing next year, the year after, um, is going to be big, and will sort of bridge the gap into, into Mortal Engines. It will, it will not, not it won't actually, this is all happening kind of 500 years before Mortal Engine, so we aren't going to meet many of the same characters or anything, but um, it's, it turns back into the same sort of book, into some sort of huge high octane cinema scope adventure, we hope, and long it's going to be, because there's a lot of ground to cover. I, 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 have, I have been killing up the characters with the regularity that I used to, so um, I've built up quite a few characters in, in, um, in the Fever Crumb books, the three Fever Crumb books, and they're all going to have to kind of have to work out with these stories in the the fourth one, so it's going to be quite chunky, I think. Um, oh yes, and that is a that is another map, um, which is sort of the landscape of of, of <coughs> Peter Crumb and Swiven's Moon. Um, it's the North Sea is kind of filled in, as you can see, which is an idea I had to come. I came up with quite early on in um, <coughs> the writing of Mortal Engines because it was really boring when when London could only kind of trundle around within the borders of. Of, of England and Scotland and Wales, so um, I decided, yeah, okay, North Sea has, has dried up, so they can go anywhere. Um, so, yeah, I think that's all fairly self-explanatory. Um, and there, I think I should stop, because I've been going for a lot longer than I thought I would. Um, does anybody have any questions at all? Please. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Uh, have you got a favourite book? Have I got a favourite book? Yeah. Um, different, different, different favourite. What you mean of mine? Oh, in but, general. In general, in general, actually, not really, because um, I, yeah, it's when I was younger, right, you know, if you asked me that when I was ten, I'd have said the Lord of the Rings for sure, completely. Uh, you know, it's undoubtedly my favourite book. Um, and then a few years later, it would have been something else. And then eventually, you just have so many favourite books that you can't you can't pick one at all um, and say, well, that's better than, than another. Um, I don't even have a favourite author. Uh, I, have, I have a sort of a pantheon of favourite authors, um, which is kind of always being added to. So no, I'm afraid I don't. Sorry. Well, I guess Lord of the Rings would probably be the, that would be the kind of the root of it all. That would be, my, that would be what, what set me off. So in a way, I have a certain fondness for that. Um, oh, and I've ripped it off as well. Let me show you. Um, I, my son uh, got to a stage, he got into, he got into Warhammer a couple of years ago, and I thought, oh, he's all sort of elves and trolls and things, I better read him Lord of the Rings quickly, because otherwise he'll read it and it'll be old hat to him. So I sat there and read him the Lord of the Rings, and um, reading that made me um, kind of want to write my own version, so I went off and did a big fantasy. Well, you know, it's a little fantasy novel, and it's silly. And uh, it will be out next year, and it's called, well, it was going to be called Clovenstone, but again, the publishers said, oh, that's got no child appeal. Clovenstone is where it's all set. So they said, no, it's going to be called Goblins. <laughs> <laughs> Which I suppose at one point. Um, <coughs> there's, there's that, that's the, that's the next <coughs> thing, that's the coming thing. Um, anyone else at all? Sorry, I deemed you all into a soporific, narcoleptic sleeper. <laughs> there are too many words. Yes, sorry. I read somewhere that there was going to be a film made of Mortal Engines, directed by Peter Jackson. Yeah, I read that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And there's going to be a film of Dark Light directed by um, T Thomas Alfredson, who did um, Let the Right One In <coughs> and, um, and uh, Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. And I know that because I read it on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the film rights sell, and uh, quite early on, I mean, the, the year, shortly after Mortal Engines was published, the film rights sold. and. Shortly before Larklight was published, the film rights sold, and, and the film rights to this went the other week as well. People buy the film rights. Um, but I have learned that that doesn't actually mean they're going to make the film. It just means they want, they, they want the right to make the film. Maybe they buy it because they think, oh, we're working on a film that's got airships in it. We don't want this one coming out and, and you know, stealing its thunder. We'll have the rights to that as well. I don't know. Um, and I, 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 with, with model engines, I'm not allowed to tell you who is interested in it, and I, I don't know what's going to happen or not. Um, I gather some sort of preparatory work has been done, I think there have been some sort of artwork and, and special effects tests and things have been done, but um, 
That doesn't mean it will be turning turn into a film anytime soon. Because basically, even if these people who own the rights actually decide that they want to do it, they then have to go to a studio and say, give us $200 million to make a movie out of this book that nobody in America has ever heard of. And I think that's going to be quite a hard sell. So I'm not, I'm not, kind of, I'm not, I'm not looking for private islands yet. <laughs> Um, but it's a possibility, yes. And there have been a lot of, a lot of rumours about it. Um, so, I don't know. We, we wait and see. Anything else? Anyone else? Please, yes. What inspires you to keep writing? Um, I don't know really. It's just I always have. I always have written. So, I couldn't imagine stopping. And occasionally I have tried to stop, you know, when I worked through the 90s, when I was just writing in distracted model engines and nobody wanted to look at it, I thought, this is ridiculous, I'm wasting so much time, you know, I, I, I should be working, with them, you know, doing something useful this time, but, um, no, I did, so, so I would stop, I would, I would throw it aside, and then, then other ideas would bubble up and sort of ask to be written down, so it's just, I, right, it's, it's what you do, really, it's, um, and of course when you get to the point where you're being published and publishers are asking you, for the next one, then what it's like to be writing money. <laughs> You've just been paid in advance on your next four levels. If you don't do one, you're going to have to pay it all back, and that would be really embarrassing because I've spent it. So, um, you know, there, there are other sort of more practical inspirations that arrive. But do you ever get ready to block, though, and just sit there like, I really want to finish this book? Yeah. Where, where do we go? What yes, do we go? yes, completely, yes. Um, I, you know, there were, I remember writing Fever Crumble, there were times that I can remember sort of trudging up to, to the post box. We live in the country and we've got like a drive up to the, the front gate of the post box. And I can remember sort of stopping up there and thinking, the only thing, the only post that could possibly interest me is um, the plot of Fever Crumb, mailed to me by my future self. Because I just got stuck on it completely. And it just, it just bogged down. Um, and it, it bogged down over that problem of how to make it link to, to the Mortal Engines books, but without repeating itself. Um, and so I left it, actually. I abandoned it for about six months to a year, and I went off and something different. I decided I did a little book called No Such Thing as Dragons, which I suspect is going to be retitled Dragons. <laughs> <laughs> In the exciting new style of a kid's life. Um, but uh, yeah, which, which was, uh, it's a tiny little book, but it's basically it's the opposite of Fever Crumb. The problem with Fever Crumb was that there were, there were too many characters and they kept having these great long conversations with each other, explaining the backstory. Oh, there were these huge conversations that went on oh, page after page after page and I couldn't work out how to cut them. So I made the hero of the Dragon's book um, mute, so he couldn't possibly have a conversation with anybody. <laughs> and, um, where uh, Fever Crumb had dozens of characters all over the place, so I, I limited it. It's, it's on some mountain in the Middle Ages and there are only four people up there. And uh, so you know, there's nowhere, nobody else can come from anywhere, so that's it. I had this very limited little cast, very little conversation, and, and it was very short, and there's a dragon. It's basically it's Jaws up a mountain with a dragon. <laughs> um, well, not Jaws with a dragon, but they're, they're actually Shark V, shark v Dragon. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the dragon plays a part of the shark. Um, it's, um, so, so yeah, I, I wrote that, and um, I went and wrote that quite, quite quickly. I wrote, a couple of weeks or a month or something, and, um, and quite sort of concentrating quite intensively on it and not thinking about people going to talk. And then when that was finished, then I went back to people going, and all the things that had seemed terribly important that I thought I couldn't cut, I realised I could just throw connected to the, the first books. The characters are all new, so there's a whole sort of different set of, of plots there. Um, the, the plot um, thing, I, I don't <coughs> plan stuff out in advance very much. I tend to start off, usually I start off, I know what the, the opening scene is, I think, of, I think of books very much in kind of film terms still, um, which maybe is bad, and, and literally people would sneer at me, but I tend to think of them like movies, and I can always see the opening shot in my mind. When I get an idea for a book, I think, oh yes, that's how it's going to start. That's the first thing you'll see. And then I usually have an idea for what the, the last shot is going to be. And sometimes that changes, but when I start, I have, I have some sort of image in mind for the end. And in between, there's just this sort of vague mist and I have to find my way from, the, the, from, from image A to image Z um, via whatever seems to work. And I tend to backtrack a lot. I, tend, I, just, I just write, and I keep writing until it all goes wrong. And then I think, right, where did this go wrong? And I go back, and then I take another, another tag. Um, so yes, sometimes, sometimes I'll, I'll, you know, something will just happen. You'll think, well, you know, this scene has been going on for a long time. I'd better have something happen. You do that Raymond Chandler thing about having a man come, when you don't know what to write, have a man come through the door with a gun. 
um, which sort of works. Um, and, um, and then also, as you're, as you're writing on doing that, then you start to think, oh yes, I can see where this might go. And you start to get dim, you dimly perceive through the mist the, 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 the places you're going to arrive at as the, as the story develops. And sometimes, I'll, I'll, at the beginning, I'll have a very clear idea of a particular kind of a scene or a sequence or something, or a place uh, or a person that I know is going to appear somewhere in the book. And I, I kind of have to work out how they're going to how they're going to arrive, how I'm going to get the story to that point. Does that make any sense? Sorry, it sounds, um, it sounds terribly vague. <laughs> and it is. <laughs> so the answer is one of those methods that I described. All of the above. All, 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 all of the above, <laughs> really. Yeah, I, I, don't kind of, I don't really have a, a sort of a process, particularly. I, I have habits that I've fallen into uh, from writing full time for a number of years. Do you get the impression other authors do it differently? I think it tends to divide. It tends to divide into people who plan everything <coughs> in advance. And I, I, I was talking to Marcus Sedgwick, who um, wrote um, oh, White Crow. Do, do you know Marcus Sedgwick? Possibly not. He's a kind of a teenage author. Yes. Um, very so, uh, so yes, it can be correct. And second-hand editions of the others are probably available from Amazon and places like that. Um, a lot. Of, I mean, I find in all the books there's a sort of subtle humour going on in the background or in it's events that coincide. Um, is that? Do you think that's you when you're writing? You're bringing back um, when you were doing screenplays and when you were writing short skits. You just have to fit something in. Yeah. Um, yes. I always. I like. I like. I like <coughs> jokes. I like. I like. I like the element of humour in the book. I don't really like. Um, don't really like. Certainly, some science fiction and fantasy things. I think. I think they need some kind of element of. <coughs> Larkiness. They need to be fun. Um, so yes, I, there, there is a, a sort of a strong element of that, and it goes back. To, I, a lot of it, I think, goes back to things like Brazil, the Terry Gilliam film. Which have you seen, or am I just showing my huge age again? Go and watch Brazil. Um, <laughs> put it on your list for film night. It's superb, um, and that's the most bizarre. It's, it's a sort of. It's certainly so. It's sort of a. <coughs> I guess it probably started life as a spoof of 1984. It's set in a sort of bizarre dystopian. Um, it's 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 not it's not really the future. It's set somewhere in the 20th century, and it's this strange sort of 1940s world, um, but with strange kind of 1940s computers that have such a tiny screen they have to then have a huge magnifying glass pulled on and pulled across the front of the wall to sort of kind of mechanised arm so you can read anything on them, um, and 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 it's. It's um, it's it's about it's about state power. It's about um, it's it's about the, the, you know the, the, the individual in a huge bureaucratic society. And it's a tremendously serious film, and yet it's very very fun all the way through. It's full of this sort of Monty Python um, surreal humour too. And that was a big influence on me. And I and, you know I can I can see the influence of that on Mortal Engines. One of the reasons Mortal Engines has got a sort of a Victorian feel is because I couldn't get the kind of nineteen forties route because it would be too like Brazil. Um, so that you know that, that that kind of element that that was one of the things that I was thought yes that's what I want my science fiction world to be like I want it to be funny and also the sort of the science fiction worlds that I remembered enjoying as a child things like Lord of the Rings and, and, and things are not noticeably packed with laughs you know <laughs> they tend to take themselves a bit seriously and that may have changed that's probably changed now but. I sort of thought a lot of a lot of the science fiction that I grew up with was quite portentous. It, it was <coughs> perhaps a little bit frightened of being jokey. Um, <coughs> sorry. Yeah. Oh, right, sorry. Um, so um, so in a way that was a way of trying to make it my own, trying to sort of carve my own territory was to was to do something that had a kind of a twist of humour in it. But um, you know whether whether the, the jokes are, are funny and whether there are enough of them is is not for me to say, but they're in there. Yeah, and, and, that, and also the whole idea of moving cities is basically stupid. So uh, I didn't want to be too serious about it. I wanted to have that kind of cartoon element to it as well. It's, it's it's hard to write a really serious novel when you've got a motorised London in the middle of it. My voice is wearing out. Is there anyone else? Yes. Um, quite a lot of the Dean Grodden Mortland's books, you've got like little throwaway references to him, like the Temple of All Known Posty. Is that the Posty? I think it is. 
Uh, which Poskett are you thinking of? The Yes, yes, John Poskett. John, John Poskett writes um, um, children's <coughs> books, basically. He, he wrote a series called Murderous Maths, which are sort of like horrible histories with maths in. Um, and they're very good. I prefer them to horrible histories, actually. I think he's, a, he's a, a, a very funny writer. And I was an illustrator for a lot of them. So um, he's, he's become quite a good friend of mine. And um, I, put it in, I put him in, partly it's a reference to him because he's my friend and I thought it would make him laugh. But mostly it's because his name sounds a bit like a swear word. And when you're writing, when you're writing children's books, you can't really swear. That's one of the, you can do most things in a children's book, but you can't really have swear words. So in moments of, um, of, of, of high drama, you need things for people to shout uh, when they're in great peril. And Poskett seemed like that. <laughs> I've, I've got another I've got a friend, a friend in Brighton called, called um, Nicholas Quirk. And um, his name also sounds like a swear word, so he became God in the first book. Um, actually, yes, he was the, he was the first um, deified friend of mine, um, was, was Quirk. And so all through the first book, people are going, for Quirk's sake, <laughs> um, and things like that. And then I kind of needed, I felt in the second one, I sort of thought, you know, we can't need it. London, he was the god of London, and London had been sort of abandoned and dealt with by the end of the first book, so I needed new gods, so I settled on Poskit as, as another one. And then also, I kind of quite like the idea that, that figures who are just celebrities in our time will have become gods in the later ones. So in mean, the Fever Crumb was St. Kylie, who has a whole area of London named after her. Um, no, she's never, it's never explained. She's never, no, no reference ever made to her beyond it's a place named St. Kylie. And then in Scrivener's Moon, I think there's a scene that's set in the Temple of St. Kylie. And, um, and the, the, the priestesses wear ceremonial hot pants. to fit in. Um, so yeah, there's, there's actually there's all sorts of music references in the, in the books, lots of sort of band names and stuff, probably from bands who, who made their last recordings long before you were even born. Um, but uh, people tended to think that I was, I was a great music fan in the first one because there's all sort of song names and things in there. But I'm not at all, I've got complete tin air for music and I don't listen to it. But my wife does and I used to sort of occasionally I glance through her music magazines and I think, you know, oh, the 13th floor elevators, that's a good name. Um, or, or there's a song called My Sharona by the Knack, which um, I always thought, I've never even heard it, but I just thought it was, it was, I was glad that there was in the world something called My Sharona by the Knack. So I called this nation called My Sharona in the engines. So it's a little obscure. It's just because I like the sound of the words, really. It's not because it, it has no um, actual relevance to, to sort of music I like. But it's nice to be able to shoot all in these, these things. I think it adds texture to the world if, if I use it, if there are phrases and things that are not mine. Not in a sort of stealing chunks of other people's books way, it can you, in a kind of little references and stuff. But when you are writing for kind of 12 year olds, really, uh, or, you know, sort of the, the centre of my target demographic will be about 12. It goes up and down, obviously, but uh, you can't rely on them to pick up obscure references to Bob Dylan songs and stuff like that. You can't expect them to get them, but I just like to put them in, um, partly because it adds a bit of texture, and partly because I quite like the idea when they're 30 or something, they'll hear the song on the radio and go, oh, that's <laughs> what I'm <that's about." laughs> So, um, yes, yeah, well, like little time bombs, little presents, you'll be just in the gifts, you'll be just out, you'll be cover. Were Poskett and Quirk happy that you'd put them in his gold? Oh, they were delighted, yes, they were very pleased, yes. <laughs> well, the strange thing about Quirk, of course, was that uh, Quirk is a god, he's, I, I sort of, Quirk is the founder of London, basically, he's the person who started London moving, and more plenty of um, he is the, the, the creator of this, this whole system of municipal Darwinism. And I thought, like, as rather was, um, you know, Caesar Augustus was, was, was turned into a god after his death and worshipped throughout the Roman Empire. <coughs> and I thought, Quirk, then the same things happened to Quirk in London. And then when I went back to write the sequels, I realised that I was going to have to write a character called Nicholas Quirk. And that was so off-putting. Um, it was so strange to have to come up with a fictional character with the same name as this um, friend of mine. Um, that it really, I think that's one of the reasons I had such trouble writing for your craft, actually, was because I was trying thinking, well, oh, actually, I can't have him here, I'll just have to mention him or something. And I, I eventually settled on, I'll give you a different name, he's put Quirkus in the original name. And I think at some point in, 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 in Fever Crump, he's, he's, he's Nikolai Quirkus, and at some point in the intervening centuries, his name has been Londonized to Nicholas Quirk. So um, that was how I got out of that. But yeah, it's, it's odd. It was, it was a strange thing. And I did kind of slightly regret that I'd used his name because it was so distracting. Yes? Uh, 
Um, is there any specific reason you pitted the Guild of Historians against the Guild of Engineers and the first Mortal Engines? Is there a kind of <coughs> conflict that you see, I mean, like um, Romanticism versus Enlightenment deal going on there? Or? It would be nice if I could say yes, because it sounds really clever. Oh, okay. Yes, <laughs> that's, 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 yes, that's what I did. Um, no, I think in the original, the early drafts were, as I say, much longer. And the, word, the, sort of the guild system didn't really exist, and it was, um, there was a council, it was the London Council, and there were various factions and individuals on that, and there were lots and lots of scenes set in the council chamber, and people were plotting against each other, and different little groups were conniving to do different things. Um, and some people wanted to keep London moving, and others thought it should slow down and stop and, and go static. And that, when, I, when I decided to turn it into a children's book, that was the first thing to go, really, because I thought, okay, you know, I, I, every, all this stuff is fine for, for, for children, but I don't think I'm going to be interested in the minutes of endless council meetings. So I decided that to streamline that, that the, the, the easiest thing to do was just to sort of split people into groups. Um, so I did. So, they, uh, so I decided, you know, the important groups in a mobile city are going to be the engineers who keep it going. And then there are the historians, because I like museums and I wanted lots of scenes set in a museum. And then there are merchants and navigators, but we never really meet any of them. It sort of seemed to come down to an engineers and be historians thing. Um, and the, the, the engineers in North Engines are kind of <coughs> bad guys, I guess, which engineers have sometimes complained to me about. Real engineers, I mean, not made up ones, um, have sometimes said, why do you make engineers the bad guys? And of course, the reason is that if you make kind of Bakers, the bad guys. <laughs> what are they going to do? They're going to cook, they, they cook an enormous cake. This is no good. We need, you know, engineers are the bad guys because they can make all this stuff um, and threaten the world with it. So, um, so that's how they end up being the bad guys. And, and you know, it seemed logical that historians would be set against them. It's, uh, as I said, there's not a lot of thought going. There's not, not a lot of conscious thought in a lot of these things. It kind of it whatever feels right, what it seems to work, um, and then I, I ferociously kind of uh, justify it all afterwards. Um, and then uh, in the later books, I did try to I did try to sort of blur that boundary a bit, and we need to set <coughs> decent engineers. But in fact, we've become an engineer. But back at the beginning, the engineers are the good guys. And they've obviously been sort of corrupted by power as they as they gain charge of this this, this giant mobile city. In a way, the few Crumb books are partly about sort of the corruption of the Guild of Engineers from this very kind of rational um, Enlightenment kind of thing at the beginning, where they're, they're the only people with any. You know, only people looking for reason in this, this mad world. And they will eventually become the, the sort of architects of this completely crazy system. So, so I guess that's really the theme of the book. Have you done? Everyone has lapsed into unconsciousness. Oh, except one word I have. Uh, do you think you're ever going to go back to like writing sketches or have you ever seen? <laughs> Only if somebody asks me to, and that seems <laughs> unlikely. I, th I think it seems to me, and I may be wrong about this, um, but it seems to me that writing has got a lot more compartmentalised lately than it used to be. I think, you know, in the 50s, you would write a book, and then maybe the BBC would come along and say, oh, write us a children's series, and then maybe you could then go work on a film, and, and then maybe you do some sketches or something, and then, or another book, or a bit of poetry. Um, whereas nowadays people seem to be novelists, screenwriters, whatever, and um, and it doesn't. It seems to be more difficult to move between the, the different things. And, and certainly, I I think if I were to if I were to try and write comedy, I'd have to start again. My 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 background in writing books <coughs> wouldn't give me any kind of traction in the world of the world of comedy at all. People would say, well, what's his part? Books, for I'm not interested. Um, Likewise with films, actually, when, when, when the film rights to the first couple of books went, I thought, oh, well, you know, maybe they'll ask me to write a, a screenplay. And I wasn't sure I wanted to do that at that time. I can't imagine it would be much worse, actually, actually working away on a screenplay for a year, and then some, the, the director comes in and changes it all. I, I, that doesn't appeal to me. But uh, it would have been nice to be asked. But no, they, they, it doesn't occur to them to ask me. They want a screenwriter to do it. So they go to somebody who has written screenplays. Um, so I have this impression, which as I say may be completely false, that, that writing has kind of developed <coughs> up much more, it's become much more specialised, and my specialty seems to be books. So I've got no plans really to go, go back to sketches. I'd rather do the Panto some years and ask. Uh, uh, that's a good <coughs> thing. And also sketches are kind of, 
I wouldn't particularly want to go out to them. I like, I like doing things listening. I like doing things, something that long seems to me to, to give me the time to kind of develop themes and develop <coughs> characters and have them do interesting things and bring it all to a conclusion. I don't write very many short stories either for the same reason. I just I'm just not that comfortable in a, in, a, in, a, in a short thing. I kind of need to, I need about 20,000 words before I feel like I can, I can kind of stretch out and, and do something interesting.